Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much, Jay, for that uh, welcome. And uh, welcome to all of you. We're glad to have you here. Um, before I pass you off to Eric Benson, whom I know is the person you came to see today, I wanted to tell you a little bit about some of the resources and tools that Schneider has put in place in the last year to help both you and your customers. So um, Schneider has recently listened to all of us regarding our need for tech support. And they've actually, we have actually put into place a, a tech support line with over 20 qualified technicians in place. They are there, they're answering the phones from 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. Monday through Friday, and that's Eastern Central Time. You can call in from the US, Canada, Puerto Rico, or Mexico. And uh, I have tested this. And of course, you know, everyone said I have questions with my own system because I live with it. Um, and they do answer, you know, once you get through the push buttons, which takes about 20 seconds, they are definitely on the phone in less than 30 seconds. So it's really phenomenal. If you've got issues, if your homeowners have issues, we now have the tech support there for you, which I know has not always been the case. So if you haven't used it, definitely use that as a resource. Um, other resources we've put in place, um, I know that all of you are out in the field. Uh, next slide, please, Eric. Um, so if you, next rainy day, take 20 minutes. Go on to the Schneider website. We actually have put uh, a new website together. Um, on that website, you're going to find uh, a design guide, a quick reference design guide, which is really a phenomenal resource if you're not already ready using it or if you haven't seen it. The whole idea behind the design guide is it's been put together for a single, dual or triple SW systems, whether AC coupled or DC coupled. The design guide gives you a bill of materials. It also has single line diagrams that you can draw on. So that's very, very helpful. Um, also commissioning. I know commissioning has at times been a little bit of a challenge for our installers. So we've created an entire commissioning guide that is online. I recommend if you haven't done a commission in a while, or if it's your first commission, definitely read through the commissioning guide. And then you can actually call tech support and tech support will do one, on one commissioning with you um, and they'll help you through that commissioning process. So our whole goal is to make commissioning as simple as possible. So this is a phenomenal new resource that you all should be using. Also uh, product registration, we've made that really simple on the website, whether you do it or your customers do it, that's there for you. We've also been putting in place a lot of trainings. So if you've been following the webinars from last year, uh, Eric and our other SAE, Jake, have been doing a phenomenal job. We have biweekly webinars going on. Um, all of the replays of those webinars are on the website. So if you missed any, you can go back and you can rewatch them. Um, and then we'll be launching our 2022 webinar series here in the very near future. We've also launched an installer program. So if you're a Schneider installer and you'd like to be featured on our website, if you'd like to be listed as a preferred installer, you can go through our installer program, which is very, very sim simple. You can be on the website so homeowners, end users can find you. You also can submit uh, installations to actually have a case study done, which is a phenomenal feature. Good marketing tool for all of you. Next slide. So within the design guide, there is a, an additional resource page, which is this one. I'm not going to go through all of these resources, but they are all here for you. I will outline the installer handbook, which is a 156 page handbook that goes through all of the different uh, Schneider equipment, solar equipment. And uh, so if you haven't seen that, take a look at it. It's very, very comprehensive. We also have a YouTube channel. If you've never been to our YouTube channel, you should definitely check it out. Most recently, Eric Benson has been doing uh, YouTube shorts. So five minute videos, tiny little videos that really are addressing a lot of the questions that installers have. So if you've got questions on um, Insight Local or Insight Cloud, he walks through different parameters, different programming parameters on those platforms. He also walks through various questions that people have had on certain equipment, uh, installation, troubleshooting. It's a really incredible resource. Um, finally, we have put in place some new resources. Jack Cross, of course, has been with us uh, for about 10 years. Marin Sadler is new to Schneider and both of them are there as a resource to installers. So if you have questions, not necessarily technical support questions, 
but questions about where to find a resource, questions about becoming a preferred installer, anything of that sort, you can reach out to Marin or Jack. They're there to answer your questions. I know for myself, um, this is phenomenal because in the past as an installer, you didn't necessarily have an actual contact with Ms. Snyder, and now you do. So definitely take advantage of these resources. Now, before uh, I leave, the last thing I wanted to talk about, next slide, please, was our testing and performance. So one of the reasons that Schneider has always had such incredible reliability is because of our testing. We don't let products out into the field until we've gone through some pretty comprehensive reliability testing. And what that has done for us, uh, next slide, please, Eric, it has created a situation where we have the lowest failure rate of any inverters in the industry for storage-based inverters. So our in failure rate, which this is an RMA rate, not really the failure rate. So our return rate is less than 1%. And if any of you would like to see the data on this, I'd love to show it to you. Um, it, it is remarkable and truly creates a situation where we are best in class. So we're gonna be in the open networking session. I will be there, Marin will be there, and Eric will be there later this afternoon. So feel free to drop in. Um, ask questions. If you'd like any of this data sent to you, you can either uh, send me an email or drop by the networking session and give me your information. So thank you so much. And I'm going to pass it off to Eric. Thank you, Kate. That was great. So uh, what we're going to cover today is uh, we're going to take a little look at battery chemistries. We're going to do a little contrast uh, between lithium ion and uh, lead acid chemistries. Uh, we'll hone in on a BMS, exactly what is it, what does it do? We'll also look at uh, open loop uh, versus closed loop communication with uh, lithium batteries. And it could be lead acid as well. If, if it's a uh, lead acid, it's always gonna be open loop. If it's a uh, lithium, then it could be closed loop. Um, it could be open loop. So we'll take a look at that. Uh, we'll look at XW Pro with the HAB battery. You know, it's a uh, it's a great battery. We've been in the integration process for some time now, and uh, we've got uh, uh, testing that's been done in the field and it's looking really good. So um, we're comfortable with uh, uh, presenting these slides and, and just giving you an idea of how everything connects together, how it programs. And, uh, um, and then of course, setting up the XW Pro system uh, in the way that you want to use it. And then finally, we'll um, take a look at some system photos. So let's start out, uh, for those of you that did not attend our uh, XW Pro session yesterday, let's just do a brief overview of XW Pro and the family of accessories that we offer for building the perfect solar system for your customer's needs. And we believe that uh, there really isn't any such thing as an all-in-one when it comes to residential solar. Their needs can vary so dramatically that you know you might get away with a single inverter, you might need two, you might need three, you might even need four in a single phase configuration. And by the way, XW Pro can also be configured for three phase for you know some high-end homes that uh, we have been involved with uh, have a three phase feeder. And then of course, small commercial uh, could also benefit from XW Pro in a three phase configuration. So uh, the family of accessories that we have are the two or the three models of solar charge controllers. The MPPT60 is a relatively lower voltage charge controller. It can accept up to 150 volts DC on the PV side. And um, it does have a, a buck transformer. So the PV voltage always has to be a little higher than the target voltage that you're trying to accomplish for your battery. So if you're trying to accomplish say um, 60 volts or 58 volts, uh, then your VMP should be no less than 70 volts uh, in the warmest part of the year. So when you're talking about min max, uh, you're looking at about 10 volts above your target bulk voltage and uh, all the way up to a maximum of 150 volts DC. And then of course we have two models of high voltage charge controllers, our MPPT80 and MPPT100, which can accept 
between 195 volts DC and 550 volts DC, absolute max is 600 volts DC. For monitoring, we have our Insight Home and Insight Facility. Insight Home is a smaller model that is designed for single inverter systems or, or small systems that, that are less than three inverters and three charge controllers. Um, that's the about the bandwidth that a single Zambus network can accommodate. And uh, it's less expensive. It's, it's just more of an affordable product than the Insight Facility, which Insight Facility is just the gateway that has a new name and they all use the same firmware. So from a firmware aspect, there's no difference. Insight Clo Cloud is our monitoring for remote uh, system uh, monitoring as well as settings access and firmware upgrades through the cloud, which will really save you on truck rolls. Um, it, it has in the past and it continues to be a great tool for installers to get in and, and see what's going on with a particular system. And many times it can be resolved from the comfort of your own office. And then, of course, we have the mobile app so your customers can see what's going on in the system in real time and also be alerted if there's any events that occur. And they also have access to uh, historical data as well. Uh, our Connects battery monitor acts as a Coulomb counter to track current in and out of the battery to provide accurate state of charge for lead acid batteries or for lithium batteries that are being configured as an open loop system. Our balance of systems include the full size power distribution panel, which ships with enough breakers to accommodate a single inverter, but can be expanded up to a triple inverter system. And then of course the mini PDP is pre-wired and marketed towards single inverter systems only. Our Connects configuration tool is a device that allows you to save configuration files for cookie cutter systems, as well as calibrate output voltages for multi-unit systems. So I always say any serious installer of our products should have one of these in their toolbox. And then for rooftop solar and NEC 690.11, 690.12, park fault rapid shutdown compliance, we have our Disconnect RS, which has a UL 1699B arc fault detector built into it. It also has a Tygo transmitter for use with Tygo TS4-F style fire safety receivers for the module level rapid shutdown. And then last but not least, we have our AGS, which is our automatic generator start module. It can be programmed for up to 14 different generator types using three separate relays for more complex generators, although most uh, generators are simple two-wire start these days. But it does give you generator uh, cool down as well as spin down uh, programmability. Uh, so a very, very flexible product there. And it also is, uh, the system is smart enough to know if the grid comes back, it'll go ahead and shut down the generator so you don't waste fuel. Now, just a brief reason why XW Pro is so popular, and I've, I've heard, you know, certain terms used that are really fitting descriptions like, uh, um, you know, utility scale, um, even though, that might mean something different for most people. I've heard it used uh, just to describe the robust, robustness of the platform. I've also heard it called uh, bulletproof um, and uh, industrial strength, but it's a platform that's proven itself in the field for over a decade. Now, even though we have a brand new control board that allows us to have all of the UL 1741SA compliance, the basic power bridge and turtle transformer and uh, AC board really remain unchanged. And, and uh, you know, it, it has served us well throughout the years and we're confident that that reliability is gonna transfer over to the pro. So, uh, you know, the pro is able to prioritize your PV and stored energy um, when you're DC coupling. It has a virtually seamless transfer. So, you know, if there is a power outage, uh, it's important that you don't lose power to say your router and uh, other devices may reset. And that's not always convenient for a homeowner to experience, especially say during a Super Bowl or whatever. So uh, yeah, it, it's, it 
eight milliseconds transfer time is is something that we've specced and uh and, and it's it's really, really close to that. I have a XW Pro in my home and I've had several outages and I've never even noticed. Um, the toroidal transformer gives the best in-class storage capability of any inverter on the market. It has dual input. You see one is designed for grid and has grid related functions associated with it. AC2 is designed for generator functionality and it's compatible with many different storage alternatives. We're gonna hone in on one today and uh, we can be DC coupled or AC coupled. Um, we really recommend DC coupling that way you'll see the PV production on our monitoring uh, platform. If you're AC coupling you kind of have to bounce back and forth between two different monitoring platforms and as long as the customer understands that then then that's fine but just manage their expectations in that regard and then we can scale up to four units in single phase or for a 25 kw nominal system and up to six units in three phase for a 40 kw 12208 system here is the tail of the tape for xw pro 6.8 kw continuously and an incredible 12 kw surge for 60 seconds 8.5 kw for 30 minutes so it's a temperature-based surge, and that really gives us another advantage we'll talk about here in a second. But uh, the maximum instantaneous uh, current is 52 amps when you're configured for 12240. Um, it has a very low harmonic total harmonic distortion, and uh, we also offer, offer uh, power factor corrected charging as well. So one of the things that really gives us an advantage in the marketplace is our completely isolated compartment for airflow. And this gives us a great benefit when you're talking about a system that's been sitting in a room for five, six, seven, 10 years, um, dust can accumulate on the circuit board. And a lot of dust has conductive properties to it, minerals and whatnot, that can lead to premature failure. And even you know small bugs and insects can also get in there and create havoc for you. So because we have a completely sealed compartment, that really contributes to the uh, longevity of the platform. So uh, I also want to point out the imbalance surge profile is another point where it gives us an advantage because you know, a homeowner doesn't always uh, know that they're going to be limited to how many devices that they can run on a particular leg. And it's not always easy to balance the loads out. Um, and, and if you have a system that is prone to tripping once one leg or the other reaches a certain limit, that can be really problematic for the homeowner. And so with the Pro, you know, because we use temperature, it allows us to sustain overloads um, to a, a much greater degree than a high frequency transformerless design. You can see from this gra graph here on a single line, we can sustain, you know, uh, 4,800 watts continuously, 6.3 kW for 30 minutes, 8.8 kW for five minutes, and uh, 12 kW for, um, a minute. So, you know, is a customer's uh, running a, a microwave, making breakfast, and they've got their um, coffee maker going, and they've got a toaster going. If that's all on one line, that could cause a nuisance trip with a competitor's product. With ours, you're not going to have to worry about those kinds of things. All right. So, XW Pro is a battery-based system. I've often had the question, well, can I just add a battery later? And the answer is no. If you don't have a battery, the Pro won't even turn on. Now, um, if you do turn it on with a battery, you can, and then qualify the grid or a generator, the system can stay powered from that AC source by rectifying the source, and, and, and it could stay powered on even uh, if the battery power is lost. But then it would require battery power to power up again if the grid went down. So uh, you, you can't add a battery later with the pros, what I'm getting at. So uh, virtually every function depends on a stable DC voltage or accurate state of charge. Uh, low state of charge is usually detrimental for the health of many different battery types. For example, if you're going less than 50% with a lead acid battery with most of them, then that's when sulfation occurs. And uh, with uh, 
lithium, you know, if you get down to a very low state of charge, um, you know, in the five or 10% uh, is usually the limit. If you get down to zero, um, there won't be detrimental, but it could nuisance trip the BMS. So they are designed to protect themselves from overcharge and over discharge. Uh, they do uh, monitor cell temperature. A lithium cell will heat up when the, the uh, state of charge or the voltage rather gets too low or the voltage gets too high. That's when the temperature climbs. So the BMS is designed to protect against that. And we're gonna talk a little bit about how the BMS works here in a second. So, so the state of health is often determined by how the battery is charged and discharged as well. Say for example, a lead acid battery, you know, if you're discharging them below 50% repeatedly, um, if it's a flooded battery, then you can equalize them to recover their performance. But if it's a sealed battery, then you could, you know, cut into the lifespan of the battery. Now, the nice thing about lithium is that they really are uh, tolerant to partial state of charge. So uh, using them throughout the full recommended range that the battery manufacturer determines is not de detrimental to the health of the battery, but some do uh, base their warranty on how deeply you discharge the battery. So uh, that's something to keep in mind. And then of course, uh, poor battery performance will have an adverse effect on the overall system performance. Because again, uh, you know, if you're using voltage control, it's gonna rely on a stable DC voltage. And, and of course, state of charge control requires that the state of charge is always uh, available in the network for, uh, for control. So a little contrast uh, lead acid with lithium iron phosphate, lead acid is subject to temperature changes that affect the performance and lifetime. So, you know, that's why we ship the battery temperature sensor with the XW Pro in case you have a lead acid battery and you are in that area that gets cold in the winter and warm in the summer. Uh, if the batteries are located in an environment like that, then the battery temperature sensor adjusts the charge voltage to a higher level when it's cold and a lower level when it's warm. And that's because uh, current flow is impeded when the temperature decreases and it's increased when the temperature de uh, increases. <clears throat> uh, lead acid battery typically don't like to be discharged more than 50%, which is why when the sulfation occurs, um, you know, some batteries, lead acid batteries advertise, you know, carbon, coating and different treatments that allow them to sustain uh, a deeper depth of discharge. But as a general rule, 50% is the limit. If you go beyond that, then you're cutting into the life of the battery or you'll have to equalize them more. And then you also have uh, charging and discharging inefficiencies as well. Uh, they're not as efficient as a lithium iron phosphate battery. Now, <clears throat> regarding lithium iron phosphate, they do have a built-in BMS. So when we talk about safety, you know, a lot of people have been reluctant to go with lithium just because uh, it's a volatile chemistry, they, they can catch fire. But uh, I've never seen that happen with any of our systems. I've, I've heard reports of it happening here and there, but, um, you know, very, very rarely. And that's what the BMS is for. It's designed to monitor the cell temperature and then disconnect the battery from the load or the charging source um, if the cell temperature gets too hot or if the voltage gets too high or low um, or if the current um, is too high. Those are the criteria that would trip a BMS. Uh, they have greater energy density. So, you know, the, the kilowatt hours takes up less room when you compare it to lead acid. The, uh, the partial state of charge tolerance is another great feature with lithium iron phosphate. Uh, they have better charging efficiency and offer up to six times more cycles than a lead acid battery. So when you talk about the cost differential between um, lithium iron phosphate and lead acid, you, you have to keep in mind that during the lifespan of a lithium iron phosphate battery, you could replace a lead acid battery bank up to three times. So what is a BMS? What does it do? So Typically, what a BMS has to do is, is protect the, the 
the cells from over temperature and disconnect the charging source or the load. And it's also important that there is a pre-charge circuit built in because XW Pro has a huge capacitor bank. It's 26 uh, millifarads, which is equivalent to 26,000 microfarads of input capacitance. So uh, the, the inrush current calculation is the capacitance uh, times the, uh, the delta of voltage divided by the delta of time. So when you close a switch, the moment that the two contacts touch each other, then um, that determines, you know, that's your divisor for your DV over DT. And when you multiply that capacitance, say, you know, it's definitely not, you know, when you first close the switch at, at a, a, a tenth of a second, you're looking at 12 and a half amps. But at a hundredth of a second, it's 125 amps. When you're talking about, uh, you know, milliseconds uh, on a scope, you can see that instantaneous value can climb very close to a thousand amps, but it doesn't blow a fuse. And the reason why is a fuse requires a longer period of time for that current to be above whatever that fuse's rating is. So with the pre-charge circuit, it has a resistor built into it. And uh, you know, your, 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 um, your time coefficient is your resistance times capacitance. So say if you use a 10 ohm resistor in about a quarter of a second, it would reach a level where you would reduce that inrush current uh, enough to go ahead and close the contactor and energize the capacitor bank of the Pro. So uh, the, the BMS protection thermal runaway closed loop controls the charge voltages. It's continually monitoring the voltage and making adjustments uh, to prevent uh, cell temperature from increasing. Uh, I have a, a lithium a discovered battery here at my home. I've had it for about five years. Uh, as far as the uh, the voltage, when I first installed it, was about 56.7 volts is what the bulk charge was at. And after five years, it's only adjusted down maybe um, seven tenths of a volt. So right now it, it charges up to about 55.9. So over time, you're going to have a little bit of adjustment in voltage, but it's really not too extreme. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, open loop and, and how to set up a system open loop to prevent nuisance tripping of the BMS uh, a little later. And uh, again, that's the whole goal of uh, using a lithium iron phosphate battery with our products is just preventing nuisance tripping. The BMS covers the, the safety factor it's not going to allow the, the battery to get too hot. So when we're talking open loop, that means there's no communication between the BMS and the charger. You could use our battery monitor for state of charge control functionality with the Pro. The charging voltage is set manually per recommendation by the battery manufacturer as well as how deeply they recommend that you discharge their battery. And by the way, you know, we've been, a, we've been uh, operating open loop with, uh, you know, Simplify for, for many, many years without any problems. So, uh, you know, uh, closed loop is really a great feature. It's, it's, it's beneficial to get in and set the system up and, and, and be on your way without having to consider too much, uh, about what the voltages need to be set for and all that. But, uh, you know, as, as long as you're setting up the system according to what the battery manufacturer recommends, most um, do support open loop as well. And then uh, for closed loop, the BMS communicates with the charger. It always adjusts the charge voltage according to cell temperature and all, as well, it manages the, uh, the current from the XW Pro. And then the SOC is also reported by the BMS so that the pro can use state of charge related functions. So the state of charge control um, allows for improved state transitions with XW Pro. We have many different functions that are based on state of charge now, which is optimal for lithium iron phosphate batteries. 
uh, because the voltage is so stiff throughout most of the range of state of charge. If you're using voltage alone, it's very difficult to tell what the state of charge is. It could be between 20 and 80% state of charge and only vary a couple of tenths of a volt. Uh, so uh, you also get optimized charging and battery over voltage protection. The uh, XW approach follows the charge and discharge limits according to what the BMS uh, dictates. And then uh, uh, it's, it's designed to just prevent nuisance tripping of the BMS and that's what it does. So we're talking about setup with the HAB battery. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Marlin is a great resource uh, over at Alti um, for uh, any questions related to the HAB. But I'm going from the documentation uh, of the HAB battery, and I'm also going off of uh, experience in this field trial that we just finished up a few weeks back. So uh, from what I understand, the HAB supports up to 14 batteries for now. Um, you'll wanna just pair up the HAB with a single pro. For multi-unit XW pros, um, we still have a, a, a few different bugs to sort out there. Um, it, it's not going to cause a, a, a problem other than we wanna make sure that the settings fan out to all the slaves as well. So uh, there's a couple of things we need to address there. So with single unit systems, you're fine. And with multiple batteries, you're fine. So you have a set of dip switches that you need to consider depending um, if you have a single HAB or if you have multiple HABs. So there's two versions of the HAB battery. There's version three, which uses an amphenol connector. The cable is supplied um, with the HAB battery. And then uh, you have inside home indicated here, Pins nine and 11 are for RS-45 communication. And the amphenol connector uses pins two and three. So pin two goes to pin nine on an inside home connector. And then pin three goes to pin 11. If you're using gateway or insight facility, it has a different connector with two different RS-45 ports. I'm just looking at RS-45 port number one here. Uh, so you would connect pin two to pin 18 and pin three to pin 20. With the version four HAB battery, they provide a RJ-45 jack for communication. So you're gonna be using just simple ethernet cables. So, cables. <clears throat> so here, uh, pin two of the RJ45 uh, cable or the ethernet cable rather is going to connect to pin nine for inside home and pin one is going to connect to pin 11. And then if you're using inside home or inside facility, then pin two will connect to pin 18 and pin one will connect to pin 20. So the next step in the process after you've established your hardwired connection is to go ahead and get logged into your Insight local device, whether it's Insight home or Insight facility, both broadcast a Wi-Fi signal that does not require internet or anything. You just connect to Insight Facility. It's broadcast as a, a wireless signal and you have a password on the back of your Insight local device on a sticker and enter that to get connected. And then you just simply enter the default IP 192.168.100.1 into your web browser. And this is the easiest way to commission a system as well by the way, and especially if you're off grid or whatever, uh, sometimes they don't have internet yet at the site. So um, we, we, we don't require internet. You can get set up just by using Wi-Fi hotspot. So once you get connected, you'll be required to log in. Uh, default username and password is indicated admin and then admin one, two, three. You will be required to change the password. 
once you get logged into your Insight Local web page, you want to click the Setup tab, and then you'll see the Modbus settings uh, section. You'll expand that. You'll need to select the baud rate, which is 19200, with parity is none and a stop bit of one, and then go ahead and apply that. Next, you're going to need to search for the device. Uh, it has a range, a Modbus range. Um, I typically use uh, one to 63. I believe it's one to 10 for the HAB battery. You need to get confirmation um, from, from Alt-E on that. But at any rate, you can just enter the entire range, like one to 256, and it, it, it'll be in there somewhere. And, and then once it's detected, uh, then it will show up as a device in your devices page. And then you can see on the lower right there how the battery is going to show up. It's going to show up as SE CAN, the BMS, and it'll show up along with all of the other uh, devices that you have in your Pro system. Here we see a single Pro with a single high voltage charge controller. So now that you're connected and you've discovered the device, the final step is to run the BMS setup. So you click on setup and then BMS setup, and then you'll get a drop down menu that allows you to select the kilovolt HAB 7.5 from the drop down. And um, uh, now, from what I understand, you're always going to select one battery because the, the kilovolt does the uh, multiple battery calculations on its on its own. So you're not going to have to enter more than one battery here. And then go ahead and ap apply that. And then it'll indicate successful as a status after it's completed. All right, so um, let's talk a little bit about uh, setting up your XW Pro system. So if you're on grid and you want to use uh, your stored energy for say time of use, then and, and block the charging during a specific period of time, uh, so you don't charge the battery with that power that costs more, you can block the charging during that that uh, uh, that period. And then, of course, your recharge SOC determines how deeply you want to load shave. So, in this particular case, I have my system set up to discharge all the way down to fifteen percent. I want to leave a little bit in case there's an outage. Um, and then, of course, uh, the SOC control needs to be enabled. That's done in the battery settings menu. Uh, you can see that the once you apply the, the BMS setup that we outlined in the previous slide, it'll automatically configure the battery type for lithium ion, and it'll automatically configure charge cycle for external BMS. So you don't have to do anything there, but you can disable or enable state of charge control, and we recommend for lithium that you enable state of charge control. Now, all of the voltage controls in the system, except for high battery cutout and low battery cutout are, are irrelevant. So, so your low battery cutout is still respected um, even though SOC control is enabled. So if you don't have these backed off out of the way, you could get some nuisance tripping. So I usually remember going, I usually recommend going up to um, say 60 volts for lithium batteries. And uh, the low battery cutout is uh, dictated by the Discover battery. So um, the, 
high SOC cutout, I have set it for 100%. The low SOC cutout, I have set it for 10%. So it's going to load shave down to 15% and stop. If it stays that way long enough and the grid doesn't come back, it'll, it'll discharge down to 10% uh, before it goes into a low battery condition. Next, you're going to enable grid support. And that determines your grid support SOC determines uh, how full your batteries will remain when you're exporting to the grid. And then when you enter the load shape time period, that dictates how deeply you discharge your batteries down to the recharge SOC limit. And then of course you can set your maximum cell amps here, how much you want to export. And then your cell block uh, is used in case you wanted to export during a certain period of time. You could do that at a certain magnitude. You could set up max cell amps to sell uh, X amount of power uh, during a particular block of time. Maybe you have some upstream loads that you want to uh, shave. Uh, it's certainly possible to do that. So you have a wide latitude of different uh, settings available uh, for maximum versatility in how you want to manage your storage. So when we're running a uh, HAB battery with XW Pro, uh, the charge controllers will still be open loop. So you can set those up according to what uh, uh, HAB recommends, kilovolt. Uh, they recommend no more than 56 volts for bulk and absorption. And then float, uh, you can set to 54. Uh, you're always gonna set the charge controller to three stage because if you try setting the charge controller to two stage, then once the absorption stage is finished, it will stop charging. So just keep that in mind. So, um, and that's, that's pretty much it. And you can use the custom battery menu to, to manually enter these values as recommended by HAB. And then finally, we have some system photos. Um, Compliments uh, Orlando Aquino, uh, Caribbean Phoenix Technologies. Uh, these systems are in uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, this is a single XW Pro with two MPPT 60s and arc fault rapid shutdown with our DRS and two of the kilovolt HAB batteries. And here we have another single XW Pro system with a mini PDP and a single MPPT 60 with a single HAB battery. And here's another, I believe that's the same one. Yeah, that's the same one. And uh, here's a system with a single Pro and a single MPVT60 and two HAB batteries. And looks like we got about 10 minutes, a little less than 10 minutes to take questions, maybe five, I think we, we uh, uh, we stopped a little bit early yesterday, five minutes to, to give time for everybody to move to the next room. So um, Kate, uh, I'll pass it over to you to read any questions that we might have. Okay, uh, well, uh, the most recent question was from James Rice Miller. And I think I know the answer to this. He, he asked if the Amphenol connectors come pre-wired for connection to inside home or do we need to make them in the field? The installers make those in the field, correct? That's correct. Well, there yeah. is there is a cable that comes with it. This is Jay. There is a cable that comes with it that is connected to the Amphenol on one end, and it has stripped wires on the other end. So you would just, in the in the field, you would just connect the stripped wires to the, uh, the terminal block. Exactly. Yeah. Perfect. Um, and then James actually followed that up with another question. How are these systems not protecting battery wires? Our AHJ requires physical protection. Well, the, the, the cables are protected by the uh, 250 amp breakers that we, um, that we ship with our balance of systems. Uh, so we, we ship uh, four aught cabling with 250 amp breakers with the, the uh, power distribution panel and uh, you have a 250 amp breaker in the mini power distribution as well. Okay. And I'm, I'm not sure. James, if that's if that's not the question you were asking, please uh, elaborate. We'll, we'll address it. 
Um, Marlon had a question for us. He, he wanted to know if, uh, if the capabilities of the Insight devices include the capabilities of the config tool, since this isn't really applicable to, oh, okay. Okay, yeah, so will the capabilities- yeah, config of the tool, tool, the only thing config tool is used for Marlin is uh, calibration of AC voltages with multi-unit systems. Um, you know, and, and basically what that does is it allows them to share the loads more evenly if if they're out of calibration you might have one that picks up a little more load than the other but as they continue to reach the maximum uh rating of the system they will level out it's not like the one that's gonna uh the the one that's picking up the most load is going to overload first it doesn't work that way but as the loads are very low you might see one inverter that has a higher output voltage picking up more load I hope that makes sense. Okay. Um, I guess if that didn't answer Marlon's question, he will reach back out. Yeah, we'll um, find out. <laughs> okay. Uh, Daryl Thayer asked, the, the rapid shutdown, is it remote control or only internal? So rapid shutdown uh, does have a local um, disconnect switch on the box itself. And we also have an initiator switch that can that is outdoor rated that you could uh, uh, mount uh, virtually anywhere. It's just a two wire, uh, and you could use like doorbell wire. That's what I use. Right, but so it's it's all physical. There's nothing remote. There's nothing remote control. There's nothing right. There's no remote control to activate it or deactivate it. It, uh, it trips if there's an arc fault and it will trip yep. if you initiate a rapid shutdown with either the local switch or with the initiator switch. Right. Yeah, I think a, a remote control would actually negate the whole need. For, I mean, the whole reason for rapid shutdown and what the jurisdictions want. So um, mm -hmm. let me see. Uh, Pete and Barnes asked, your photos are from Puerto Rico. How did your system hold up during their hurricanes and how long did it take for repairs to be completed? Interesting yeah, question. That's a, yeah, that's a good question. So, I mean, most of the business that we've seen in Puerto Rico is, you know, since been since Maria. You know, they, they learned the hard way that uh, a bad hurricane can leave most the, the residents without power for extended periods of time, which is why, uh, you know, uh, backup systems like this are, are becoming so popular. But uh, yeah, I don't think there's really been a, a hurricane as significant as Maria since. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a great question. If there's another really bad hurricane, you know, it can take your PV panels and, and send them flying, you know, depending on how how bad it is, but you know, the pro and the hab are indoor. Well, I can't speak to the hab, but I can speak to the pro. It's an indoor rated uh, uh, platform. So it's not going to be the same with the hab, Eric. Yeah. yeah. And you know, there's, there's some pretty tight um, regulations on panels in Puerto Rico, um, you know, for, for a number of things, wind loads uh, mm -hmm. being, being one of them there. So uh, I think Maria was especially strong, but you know the, the, they frequently get hurricanes coming through that are are less strong. Um, yeah, but, yeah. Know, I, I, I mean, I, I know I know panels are load tested and 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 whatnot, but if a hurricane is strong enough, you know, it's it, yeah. I, I don't it's, remember what the what the wind rating is, but there is a certain wind rating that. They need to mm -hmm. uh, withstand down there and uh, the mountain right. brackets and et cetera as well. But, um, uh, you know, I think one of the reasons why battery-based systems have been so popular in Puerto Rico, it's been a, a very uh, hot area, I know, for, for both of our companies, um, is, is just because of the frequency of the hurricanes and the power outages. And, um, you know, I think the fact that the electric utility PREPA has, has been uh, essentially uh, privatized uh, is also not helping things down there. So, so people are looking for um, grid independence, definitely. 
uh, down in there just just for the the issues uh, that are coming up, storm or no storm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so is that the questions lined up there? Um, we do have questions lined up. Are we running out of time? Are we out of we've, time? We've got just a couple minutes left, but yeah, let's okay. see which which ones of these we can uh, we can okay. knock off. So, um, let me see. Is there a way to wire a relay disconnect to comply with whole home disconnect requirements to the XW Pro uh, inverter and solar all in one, rather than breaking the wire from the inverters to the main panel? And he's talking about 2020 NEC code 2230.85. Yeah, we'll probably need to take that into the uh, the uh, into the session. Yes, session okay. the networking yeah. session this afternoon. Yeah, that's a good idea. Perfect. And then uh, James had come back, um, so he wanted to know if there are plans to standard hide standardize the KOs for US sizing because the uh, HAB KOs are metric and they're required to run uh, conduit. Yeah, so that's a good the one. power knockouts are 28 and 53 and a half millimeters. Um, so they are, they are metric. And I guess uh, to James's earlier question, the um, it's really up to the local uh, jurisdiction as to whether or not conduit is required for those uh, for those runs. Right. Um, I think he, his, his question was, I guess, around the conduit, not so much the uh, breaker protection. Right, and, and his jurisdiction is requiring conduit, so that was that was yeah. really what he's what he's asking is, are they going to release something that's in U.S. Uh, measurements rather than metric? Um, I don't believe we have any any plans to change that dimension at this time. Um, that's actually the first time I've I've heard of a concern about that. So I can I can take it back to our development team there. But um, at this point, I can just say we don't have any plan to do that. Okay. Yeah, I, I I did talk to this installer uh, who you know he looks like he's got flex conduit run from the pro to the battery so um he did find a way to do it well here well here he doesn't but here he does um mm -hmm. so um that's actually that's a good question well it's let's see oh, I, I thought it was flex maybe he's just using black wire yeah that's that's a good question but he 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 does have uh fittings for these um yeah they come with fittings yeah they come oh, with on fittings. the battery right i see yeah. mm -hmm. you know with threaded uh a, a so thread. those, that's what he's talking about he's saying that those are metric and what's on the the, the our balance of systems is uh um us mm -hmm. yeah, I'm yeah that's a good question we'll have, to, we'll have to look into that yeah Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and then uh, Laverro, hi Laverro, um, he asked, in open loop with lithium ion prismatic cells, does the battery monitor have the authority to disconnect the battery? No, there's no, there's no um, communication whatsoever in open loop with the BMS. Um, all the battery monitor is doing is acting as a Coulomb counter to track the current in and out of the battery and provide you with an accurate state of charge to benefit from the state of con charge control functionality that is possessed in the XW Pro, which is why if you have open loop, then you need to reach out to the battery manufacturers and find out what uh, their charge voltage limits and charge current limits are and uh, you know, make sure that your PV um, does not exceed that current limit and that your charge voltages are set using the custom battery menu. And uh, if your grid charging and PV charging would exceed the rating of the battery for current, then you can block charging during solar hours 
using the charge block function of XW Pro. That way you won't add to the PV with your grid charging. I think that's probably where we're going to have to hold it for, for today, Eric. And then we can continue in the open networking session. That's a great opportunity to go into more detail on a lot of these things. Uh, this one Sounds good. Yeah. All right. But thank you both. Thank you, uh, Kate and Eric.